Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for waiting a couple of minutes. I know we're getting started a couple of minutes past 12, but hopefully you guys enjoyed some of the wave scenes and the music in the waiting room there. Uh, I'm Michael Owens. I am the co-founder of Influence Group, producer of the Senior Living Innovation Forum. And this is our first installment of The Community by Sliff. Now, it's great. I can see, I guess, in the uh, attendee, in the, in the list right here, we've got a lot of friends and a lot of great people that know us from coming to live events. And unfortunately, at the moment, we can't be putting those together right now. We obviously are doing things in the fall. But we're bringing uh, you guys together here um, for our webcast platform. Now, we've all been in a lot of webinars, a lot of Zoom meetings over the past few weeks and months. And uh, we've, of course, realized that we can do these things virtually, bring people together. So our goal with the community is to dive into some topics that we know are top of mind right now but also really allow you guys to have your voice be heard. I think one of the things that we've seen by doing a lot of webinars and webcasts or attending them is that lack of interactivity. So for here, we're gonna to talk today about evolving the, um, the perception of senior living. Um, we've got wonderful guests. We have Lynn Katzman from Juniper Communities and Lori Alford from Avanti. And a little bit later on, we're gonna be joined by Ken Schmidt, former communications director for Harley Davidson, who for a lot of you that attended SLIF two years ago, he was our keynote speaker out in Napa and was one of the best speakers we had um, at SLIF and probably at an influence group event. So really excited to have him joining us to kind of give us some perception from, um, and insights from outside the industry. Um, a few things before we do get started. In the chat, which I can see right here now, we have a lot of you commenting. Um, there's also a Q&A section. And if you have questions, we want you to put those in there. We have a producer, his name is Jason, behind the scenes, Jason Schwab, you'll see his name come up. Um, he will try to get your questions kind of funneled over to, to myself and he may come live on screen. Another thing we're gonna try to attempt is if you are camera ready, um, you know, we all know that a lot of people haven't gotten haircuts yet, don't worry about that, we're all community. But if you wanna go live on camera, we can bring you live on camera, or at least we're gonna to attempt to. We've already had a few technical issues and I'm hopefully Behind the scenes, we're getting those worked out right now. Um, but before we bring up our guests, I also wanna demonstrate our polling feature here. You'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, there are some polls that we're gonna run throughout the course of the uh, conversation today. And um, the I'm gonna publish the first one now. Uh, it's a very serious one and um, it's very scientific and it's anonymous. So we want everybody that goes on here, and this is just a test to show how the polling works, to give an honest answer, okay? So the question is, how much weight have you gained over the last three months? Let's see as the results come in. We wanna see how, uh, what's the health of our community? And again, be honest here, because we can see on the back, we can't see on the back, and I'm joking, but. All right. And this is some key insights for us for our next one when we're gonna do uh, our SLIF um, community aerobics uh, virtual exercise. So there we go. We've got most people five pounds. All right, 30% of people, none. And we've got 26% of people actually in better shape. So not shaming anybody there. But anyway, just wanted to show the polling. We're gonna have obviously some more serious polls that are gonna go on throughout the conversation here. Um, but now I'd like to welcome to the screen, to the stage, um, Lori Alford and Lynn Katzman, I've got my fingers crossed that this is gonna work. Um, so if Lori and Lynn can turn your camera and mics on, we can welcome you guys to the stage. Is uh, I'm trying. Oh, I can hear her. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Alford coming live to us from <laughs> Houston, Texas, from the Woodlands. Uh, there's a little icon on the top to turn on your camera. There we Is go. My... All right. Can you see me? Yay. Yay. Oh. So, Lori, can we hear you? Uh-huh. All right. I can, hear you. can everybody in the chat, can you guys hear and see us fine? Houston Strong. Houston Strong. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, Proud husbands coming from Florida. So, can you guys hear and hey. see Lori? Okay, well, Lynn, I know we we're having a little bit of technical issues coming in on, on the back end here. Um, hey, Lynn, I'm talking on the phone. Can you see us or hear us? No, you can hear me on the phone. Okay, hey guys, 
we're learning here. As have, you can her, see. have her dial in. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, that, that, that'll that probably bring some feedback. Oh, wait, guys, look. It's it's Lynn Cotman. There, there we go. You hear me. I can yeah. hear you fine. Yeah. So I'm just going to leave you on here. It may be a little bit delayed, everyone there, but we don't want to miss out on Lynn Katzman's insights. So oh, first, I want to start up with thanking you guys for joining us. Um, you guys have been wonderful supporters of ours and contributors to the program, live and in person and through the content we pushed out. Um, but today, you know, I want to dive into the topic, being conscious of people's time here. Um, before we get into, you know, the perception issue with senior housing, how have you guys been? Uh, Lynn, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you know, how has this impacted Juniper, um, COVID-19? Yeah, life's been up and down. A lot of interesting times. Um, the uncertainty has just been very, very difficult often. Uh, I think for me, though, leadership has been full of learning. And so I'm actually grateful for the opportunity to lead again. You know, I spend a lot of my time on the road mm -hmm. and now that's not the case. So I've had to assume both leadership of strategy as well as execution. And mm -hmm. in these times that's been powerful learning and made a powerful difference. Mm -hmm. And Lori, how about for yourself? How has COVID-19 impacted uh, Avanti? Um, well, it, you know, I think like any operator out there, we've had to basically turn our ships upside down, shake it out, flip it over and learn how to reoperate given COVID expectations um, and regulation mandates, keeping our uh, team members safe, our residents safe. So it's, it's definitely been challenging. Um, but as Lynn pointed out, it, you know, every challenge presents a great opportunity. So mm -hmm. during that time, you know, I've learned things about leadership for me personally that I, you know, would have never had to face until a crisis. Um, and also learned, you know, where we were weak in the company and, but yet where we're really strong. And so crisis allows us to identify those um, quicker and definitely shines on the good and the bad. And so we've, we've learned a lot in me personally. I've, I've learned to enjoy drinking every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I live in an apartment building and the, the running joke is like, you know, everyone brings their garbage down to the floor. And it's like, you don't want to go out and hear all the clanging with the wine bottles that are yeah. going there. So I go at certain hours. So people aren't judging me in the hallway. Um, so, but on, on the topic, how about infections um, within your communities? Well, I think Lori's got a better story than I do, so I'll let her start. Okay. We're, we're, we still remain COVID free. A little bit of luck, a little bit of strategy, and a little bit more luck. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to point to um, a study that came out this morning um, that named a researcher from the University of Chicago, as well as Harvard's David Grabowski. And one of the things they pointed to is that quality has nothing to do with the chance that your community or little to do with the chance that your community might have an outbreak of COVID. And I, that rings true to me. We did have outbreaks of COVID in two hotspot areas, one outside of Colorado mm -hmm. and one in New Jersey. Uh, we have uh, virtually no COVID at the moment. Our only cases are among staff who uh, tested positive and are isolating at home again in hotspot areas. But, um, we it's been fascinating. We started testing really early on. We tested everyone. And in early April, we realized that the majority of the infection was spreading from asymptomatic people. Mm -hmm. And now that doesn't seem like an earth shattering notion, but at the no. time it was really different because they were only mm -hmm. testing people who uh, had symptoms. And there's a reason for that. So SARS-CoV-2 is the second COVID idea, mm -hmm. but I will tell you that um, SARS, which struck in 2003, sounds similar, but it was very different. 
the infection actually started there in the lungs. The infection in SARS-CoV-2 starts in the nose. Mm -hmm. And so it actually begins to be transmittable early on, but before people notice symptoms. Yeah. And so people didn't get that at first. There was really not enough research. And so our testing showed that. It showed that some of the things that the CDC and the government were suggesting, like screening at the door, helpful, necessary, but not sufficient. So we learned a lot through that process. Uh, I think we've got infection completely under, well, completely is too big a word, but very much under control. I think, again, quality doesn't necessarily Absolutely. determine whether you're going to be COVID free or not, but it certainly helps. So I want to believe uh, that our team did a great job. And frankly, very few people passed away as a result of COVID and we're very proud of that. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would underscore that. And I say that frequently because obviously the first question everyone asks any operator is how many COVID residents have you had? And, you know, we've been fortunate enough that we're able to say none, but I always say that that doesn't make operators that have COVID, that doesn't make them a bad operator. Um, well, that's what I was going to say. Like, yeah. A lot of folks like Lynn, you know, where her buildings were hit, they are in the big, massive hot spots. And so her area, Washington, you know, we're in Texas and Louisiana. We learned quick. We watched and we adapted quick because we got ready. We got ready for the party to happen. Um, and we had advance notice, unlike Lynn and a lot of other operators. They they had no advance notice. They had nothing to learn with. They just, you know, they, they took the lickings for us. So Yeah. Yeah. And obviously Lynn, I know you're up here. I'm in New York City. Lynn, you know, you're you're in Montclair, New Jersey. Which uh, yep. which by the way, I'm going to actually look at property there this weekend. So maybe you can give me some tips offline. Um, ah, but cool. I guess this is forcing my family now to say maybe it's time to get out of the city, but that's a whole other discussion. You can do that. I can help you there. <laughs> um, but just for people that are joining, because I see a few people actually asking who is Lynn with? I guess I always assume that everyone knows Lynn Katzman. Um, for those that are joining late, Lynn Katzman is with Juniper Communities um, based up here in the Northeast. And um, obviously there's communities across the country. And Lori Alfred's with Avanti uh, Senior Living um, in Houston, in, in, based in Houston, Texas, but obviously communities outside there as well. Um, so keeping on the topic, going into this, so we want to talk about the media. And, uh, you know, specifically, of course, on the media's perception and the public's perception right now with regards to COVID-19. Um, even prior to the pandemic, we know that there's kind of a, you know, perception out there. And Ken Schmidt, uh, who's going to be joining us in a little while, did speak about this just a few years ago. And I'll show a clip of that in a little moment, too, about the public's perception kind of all lumping together nursing homes with assisted living and, and senior living. But before we get into that, I do want to even just show... I, right before this, I went online, just tried to pull up Google News, put in senior living. And right up at the top, there was a you know story from Time Magazine and another one from USA Today, just from yesterday, I believe. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to show the uh, USA Today one right now. You can see, um, should be able to see up on the screen. It is a national disgrace. Mm -hmm. 40,600 deaths tied to U.S. nursing homes. And then, of course, here is now nursing homes. We can say, all right, it's nursing homes. But here's Time magazine. And maybe Time doesn't have the cachets of what it used to have. But it's still, you know, national publication is America's assisted living residents are falling through the cracks of residents are falling through the cracks of COVID-19 response. So you guys are everyone who's tuning in is aware of this. We all see on the news, even if but we're inside the industry. So fortunately, we are aware of all the positive things that are happening right now. You know, if you go through Senior Living Foresight, Senior Housing News, McKnight's, there's nothing but wonderful stories besides, you know, obviously the negative um, there. So I want to, you know, I guess get into that with you guys. Um, and um, I guess, Lynn, let's go to you. I mean, I'd like to get your your your, your perception on this, on the, on the perception, kind of what your thoughts are. And, um, you know, and, and going into, I guess, the, the argument now about age in place versus senior housing. Well, let me ask you, uh, if any of you have an older parent, I have an 88 year old mother and a 96 year old mother-in-law. Both of them are in relatively good health and both still drive and are functionally mobile. Mm -hmm. Both, uh, my mother lives alone about three miles away from me. My mother's not been out of the house 
in three months, with the exception of one trip to my house last week to celebrate a birthday. Other than that, we have been dropping groceries at her front door. She hasn't needed to see a doctor. We've been able to pick up her prescriptions. Uh, we've taken care of home repairs, everything from changing light bulbs to getting the garbage out. What happens if you can't do that? Mm -hmm. Who does that for you? So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, when you need help and you need to have either home care or a homemaker or just a handy person come to the door, how do you know that those people aren't bringing with them the virus? How do you know that they haven't been to another home that day where another person is infected? And where I'm going with this is obvious and simple. Uh, being at home is no guarantee, particularly if you have chronic conditions and you need assistance, that you will be safe. Yeah. If you then add to that isolation, social isolation, and the opportunity for depression, I think it gets that much worse. So, I, you know, I think home care is something that's been talked up. And I think people have perhaps a mistaken notion that being at home works. I think mm -hmm. it does for some people who have the resources and the support system to make it work. But what about everyone else? Yeah. What about everyone else? What about the people without the money? I see someone's asking about the forgotten metal. Well, that's... So true. If you can't hire someone, what are you going to do? You're going to go out to the store. You're going to put yourself at risk. And if you get sick, you could end up in the hospital. So I think there's uh, a number of issues with it. I think the image, however, of senior living, uh, we've got some work to do. We have to rebuild trust. And I think the nursing home uh, publicity which frankly has been, uh, I think we've been lumped into the same pot, if you will, has not done us any good. And I think we've got to dig our way out. And I think there are a number of really good ways to do it. And I'm really interested to hear more about our discussion moving forward about how we're going to create that image to, um, to facilitate trust moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I see some good some good comments as you mentioned in the chat, and I did see uh, when I was scrolling through. I saw Bob Kramer. Um, I guess he was making a reference to enjoying a glass of wine at the end of the day there too. So cheers to that, Bob. Um, but Bob, of course, we did a session with him a few uh, about a month and a half ago on a different platform, and, and also published uh, an article. And uh, you know, I know he's he's been talking a lot of these issues too. But you know, it's it's one thing we understand where things are going. Um, and Steve Rand saying is that we're worried that we're throwing nursing homes under the bus. So just you know, moving along kind of, you know, the perception of the, the public, the consumer, but the biggest challenge prior to COVID-19 was the labor issue, right? And mm -hmm. when this happened, it was like, oh, this is gonna free up the labor market. And it's gonna make it a lot easier for senior housing leaders to recruit. How do you see that that, where are we now on that thought? And what do you think is the challenge gonna be now with the perception of, the labor force wanting to work in senior housing. I'll, I'll happily answer that. And to answer, I do want to say about the media, I think the media is disgusting because they want to put up there that nursing homes and senior living is outraged by the deaths. More people are alive and safe because of us that have died because of an awful virus. And so mm -hmm. shame on the media for wanting to lead with what bleeds and that they've done a great job with. And I proudly stand by our industry and any operator in our industry and applaud everybody. But um, to to your question of staffing, I, I figured out very early on when er things started to shut down, in fact, Lynn and I had a conversation about this and I said, it's not gonna work. Like, I don't know why our industry is trying to pump all this up with the $600 extra per week on top of unemployment. Mm -hmm. In most states, they're making more money to be unemployed of course, yeah. than employed. So why would they want to come to work and make less money? And then why would they want to expose themselves? And, you know, a lot of folks from hospitality, that's great. But we need caregivers. We need med techs. We need housekeepers. 
Um, you know, and hospitality doesn't breed all of those positions. And so um, I, I think we're still faced with the same challenges. Um, I think it helps that unemployment is high because it does take those team members that have a job with us. Um, thankful they have a job with us, especially if the, if the operator treated them well and their culture is good. So mm -hmm. they're glad to have a job and they're less likely to quit and go get another job someplace next door because a lot of places aren't hiring. But I don't think this the, the, the level of people, the type of people that have been laid off aren't necessarily folks that fit into our mold. Not, not, and the ones that are, they're they're making, at least in Texas, they can go make more money on unemployment than they can working for Avanti. So it hasn't worked out quite that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, again, you know, kind of want to talking about this and we know the challenges there, but it goes back into it. It's that the industry, everyone tuned in here now, we all understand the value proposition. We understand why, you know, the social isolation, um, the community, um, but, um, you know, I, I wanted, I guess now, I guess we're probably the perfect time to bring in Ken Schmidt. Um, and before we do that, I want to, I guess, for the audience, for a little context, as I mentioned, Ken spoke at SLIF, uh, Senior Living Innovation Forum, back in Napa about two years ago. And he talked about that. The perception is that a lot of people, the consumers and people, you know, potential uh, hires, just look at the industry as a nursing home. And, you know, it goes a bit larger than kind of just changing the narrative and, you know, what the media is saying. So I'm going to show a little uh, clip of that right now. At the words nursing, the words nursing home. home. And I'm sorry, I'm going to use, sorry, that, language. use that language. I know you don't. common terminology that people use. When you're not in control of your narrative, when the market determines and decides who you are, you spend the majority of your professional lives trying to disprove negative stereotypes, which trust me, I know a lot about, misinformation, mistruth, and, and to also balance expectations people have that are based on non-factual stuff. Unless or until we, meaning all of us, gain and seize control of our narrative, what people believe to be true about us and what they say about us, we will forever operate under a black cloud. Other countries don't have the black cloud, the fear of growing old or being taken care of by somebody else that we do here. The solution to that problem lies with the people that are here, the people who have the most to gain by solving the problem. And unfortunately, because I see this everywhere I go, I've, I've been around literally thousands of businesses in the last 20 years, as I see this common thread that flows through businesses and among business owners and managers of business, and it, it, and it plays out like this, everybody is waiting for somebody to do something that's gonna somehow make all these problems go away. And until that somebody comes up with that something, we're gonna just continue doing what we've always done. We're gonna wait for the trade association to fix it. We're gonna wait, God save us all for the federal government to do something about this. We're gonna wait for the rest of the world to catch up to the way we do things. And 100% of us in the room know that's not going to happen. Can I make you go live and hold on, let me decline a FaceTime request from my daughter trying to call me at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Ken, if you're there, I'd still like to get your take on uh, the federal government's not going to fix things for us even now. They're, 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 they're busy right now, Michael. They're, uh, they're FaceTiming with your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and th thanks for joining us. Um, you know, you know, that, that talk, of course, uh, was one of the, the highlights of, you know, our, our, since we started running SLIF five years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously very relevant right now. So you've been listening in on the conversation kind of backstage. Um, you know, what, what is your take? And I know that we've had a conversation just uh, last week about this. Um, another thing that you talked about during that talk was your experience with, uh, I believe it was your father-in-law or your mother-in-law shopping for senior housing. And you, you told a funny story about when you were in for a, um, you know, you were having, you were dining and someone was in for a tour. Do you want to share that, that story? Oh, sure. Let me, let me share that story. And it, this is, uh, this, it's not a PG 13 yeah. story. I, I don't believe in sanitizing things, but uh, when my father-in-law who since passed, uh, 
two and a half years ago, we were looking at assisted living for him because he needed it. And we found him a nice place not too far from here. Uh, but two weeks after he was in and settled in and comfortable and he wasn't complaining about it, we were having lunch with him. And as we were having lunch in the kitchen area, uh, a family was taking their, their, their mother around and showing them the facility that she was about to be moving into. And right in the middle of her lunch, this is burned into my brain. She said, Jesus Christ, this is a fucking nursing home. And my father was like, surprise. And, so, and everybody started laughing because it was kind of the same line that we told, you know, our loved ones that you know, we everybody tries putting a magical word on top of it to make things softer and lighter for people to accept because the narrative states that, you know, a, a nursing home is a scary place. Uh, it shouldn't be, uh, but that's the current narrative that's out there in the world right now. And I would say, to anyone right now who is disappointed with the media coverage that uh, the entire industry has been uh, suffering from as of late, this is uh, that's a siren. And it's a siren that's screaming really loud and we can do one of two things. We could run away from this or we could run toward this. The spotlight is shining on the industry right now. You're top of mind. You're right there in Time Magazine and you know, USA Today or whatever other rags are still out there. And if everyone that's on this call right now or is going to see those comments, you know, from, from Time or what, you know, that Mike was just showing us, aren't personally going to do something about it, then you, that. Better, you better get comfortable living with that. You pick up the phone. The person that write that wrote that article, the write, writes those articles, their names are on there. You pick it up and you call it and you make it very personal. They're not targeting you. They're not in their minds being unfair. They're simply parroting what they believe to be true because no one's told them otherwise. Mike alluded to this a second ago. This is it, it's rampant in every industry. Everybody's waiting for somebody else to fix this. Uh, and nobody knows who that somebody is because nobody's doing it. Well, I sure wish somebody would get a handle on this. Well, how about you? So can I make a comment? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. You are saying something simple but profound. We need to go on the offense and stop being on the defense all the Absolutely. time. We have to stop apologizing for who we are and start talking about all not just the good that we do, but create an environment where people can see themselves living with us. And so I think we have work to do, but we certainly have to change the way we talk about our work. We do, and then uh, that, that's such a great point, Lynn, but also if we want people in media or any position of influence on, on your business, on your industry, on your local, business if we want them to see us support us talk about us the way we'd like them to, to talk about us that means we need to get personal with them that means we invite them in we show them around we should we let them see with their own eyes because unless or until we're doing that they're always operating uh, in a vacuum they're looking at whatever they you know the first thing that came up on google you know because they've got a deadline to fill minus that personal side Minus that belief, that, hey, I know these people. These are good people. They're running good businesses. They do a tremendous amount of good. If I don't know that, I'm not going to write about it. I'm not going to tell other people. That, that was, if I can generalize here, when I first started working at Harley Davidson, which had probably the worst reputation of any industry on the planet for years, I mean, the, the single most popular word used to describe us uh, were outlaws, which criminal activity, which very few of us engaged in. Uh, I heard a few people, but that's for, subject for another time. <laughs> what we realized is that we had spent the better part of our professional careers waiting for these problems to go away. People didn't see us the way we wanted to be seen. They didn't talk about us the way we wanted to be talked about. And then 
till we got essentially to the point where we were about to file for bankruptcy, nobody ever stood up and said, hey, the people that own the solution to this problem are here right now. Mm -hmm. We either wrestle and get control of our narrative, what people say about us and what we say about ourselves, or we just roll over and let other people define that for us. And see what a lot of leaders and businesses think, because I have these conversations with them every day, that if we're going to shape our narrative to be more positive, you know, we're going to build our reputation off this positive narrative. You know, we're going to build that reputation through the advocacy of these important people talking for us. Leaders tend to think that that somehow falls under the umbrella of you know, marketing or communications, or, you know, this is something for our salespeople to worry about. And they don't think of this in terms of, you know, business process, but we're talking about who we are and what we do and who we do it for and why people should like us and respect us for doing that and tell others how great we are at doing it. That's something that a business leader needs to put at the very top of their business process is this, what do we need to be focused on here as a business, especially now, you know, while people are looking at us and I don't want to uh, soapbox too much here, but what I would say, and, and I talked about it at the Smith meeting at Napa, which was a great meeting, by the way, uh, that's probably the most wine I've had in, in, on one Sunday night in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, 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 and I know I talked about this at a meeting. What leaders need to focus on are the three most important questions that any business could ever hope to answer. And the questions are, what are people saying about us? What do we want them to say about us? And then third and most important is, what are we doing to make them say it? Mm -hmm. we, we can craft all the messaging we want. You know, we come up with slogans and, and great positioning language and messaging, but unless we as a business uh, harnessing the power of our business culture are actively living messaging that we want the world to repeat, actively using the kind of language that we want the world to repeat and encouraging that, making it part of our business process, it's never going to happen. The advocacy yeah, so driving narrative is an all hands effort. If the person answering the phone doesn't describe your facility or facilities the same way somebody in sales does, the same way someone in the kitchen area does, the same way a nurse's aide does, you've got a problem, right? And then yeah. we wonder why the outside world doesn't understand us. We don't even know who we are, right? Yeah, so, so I've heard, I've heard, I've heard, I'm sorry, Lori, go. go ahead. That's okay. So I, to me, I think what COVID has really demonstrated is that our industry at large is invisible. I don't think we're forgotten. I think we're just invisible. Um, and that has been evidenced by being not in a lot of the legislation um, at a state level as well as the federal level, um, not being provided help with PPE. Um, and all of those kind of things. And so, you know, I, we're invisible. And I, I would argue that although our industry definitely need to get better at messaging, um, I feel like at least if I were to look at each of the markets that we operate in, the marketplace kind of knows who we are. But the people that are talking now, they don't know who we are. So our industry has not done a good job of contacting congressmen and women senators. Um, we've not done a good job at contacting national media, because I know there's a ton of local level media that is positive. Um, it's, it's a much bigger issue that I think is beyond just having the right nomenclature. I think the, a lot of the people right now that need to know about us, they don't. And that yeah. has been exposed through this COVID. And we need we as an industry need to solve that. So that next time around when this happens, we don't have this problem. And going forward, we're on their forefront and we're not reactive. We're not talking to the congressman 10 weeks after, you know, an issue has happened. When something is presented, they're like, hey, what about that senior housing industry? Because we're seen. We need to be seen by the right people. But, but the, the question I guess I got to throw here, because I think, Ken, you said it in that one clip I shared, is that waiting for government or even the trade associations, <laughs> excuse me, and, you know, our gens in leading age, they've been doing, uh, you know, uh, 
great job out there lobbying for PPE and doing what, you know, uh, on the front lines for that. But the perception is it come down to the operators, right? And, and the owners really to kind of get out there. I mean, Ken, I, you know, I, I've, I've read your book and obviously seen you spoke and, uh, you know, the, the thing that you said is that nobody believes in what you say about yourself. I mean, that's what you said is that what they want to do is they want to hear it coming from the words of your customer or the potential customer, right? Like, so the messaging and the marketing as you're hitting on, um, you know, coming out of this is a challenge, right? We all know that, that, that you, it's a part of what, you know, you, that to get people in for tours and to talk about the safety and the community and, and tackling the isolation uh, issues. But, you know, what would be your tip to our audience, which primarily are CEOs, owners, operators of senior housing, um, and of course, the, the, our, you know, our sponsors and vendors to support the industry, they have a voice as well, and, and everyone here wants to see the industry move forward. You know, and I think that's one other thing to talk, talk about here is the importance of collaboration in in, in an environment like this. Um, you know, I know Lynn and Lori that you guys, you know, you guys are friends, right? I mean, you, but you've come together a common bond within the industry. But and we I think also that's work kind of together. Like we work the community. We um, also work together, and Lori's taken the lead in a number of ways to bring a, a group of industry collaborators together to to look at how we, what is our pathway forward, particularly post COVID. Mm -hmm. So I I think that collaboration is coming together. Before mm -hmm. you go on. Um, Michael, I want to respond to something Ken said. Ken, I, I can't hear you because I'm hearing this conversation through Michael's phone. So forgive me if I misunderstood what you said. Okay. But you were talking about going to a senior living community with your parents, I believe, and someone yelled out, this is nothing but a whatever Personally. nursing You can say it, Lynn. You can say it. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not going to say it. I'm, I'm polite today. You know, you don't know me that well, but days I might say that. Uh -huh. but the, the answer is, it's not just what we message. It's what we experience. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of really good comments on the chat here. We've got to create an experience that the next generation of consumers wants. And then we've got to show them that the experience represents them. They have to actually, they have to feel it. We, we can show it, but at the end of the day, when you walk through the senior living community, you have to see yourself sitting in that chair. And frankly, most people can't do that because even if they are frail, they see that other person in a wheelchair or with a walker or with a cane, and they think, that's not me. I'm not there. And so we've got to create a different environment. Frankly, in my mind, it's one that not hey, Lynn. only creates different Lynn, let me interject right there. Hold on. Hey, I'm not done. You can't interject. Okay. I'm okay. done, Lori. Okay. Because I, I got a good highlight for you. You'll All like right. It. Good, good, good. I'm sure you do. But my <laughs> point is, you got to have people from the community in. It's got to look like the community they came from, and it's got to mm -hmm. feel like the community they came from. You can't create segregated environments and think that people are going to be happy there. So I think we have to change what we do, and I think people have to be able to see themselves within it, and the messaging will follow. So, Lori, before you, before you come in with your comment, um, there are a couple of polls that I wanted to run, and we've kind of gone into it. But this one, it may, I think I may know where you're going with this, Lori. It may be wrong. But this is, it's SLIF, and it was actually in Napa a couple of years ago. We had a panel with some CEOs where the question was posed to them, would you happily live in one of your communities today? And, you know, a few of them were basically honest saying no. So I wanted, I'm going to ask this poll right now. Um, you know, and this is directed strictly to operators. So, you know, hang on. Don't answer it, um, obviously, if, if you're not an operator. Uh, operator owner, but I want to get your, your take on this. Be honest. And again, this is happy live today. Not what, you, what you're imagining your, your future product with, you know, all these amazing services that um, we've been talking about that is yet really to be realized. All right. Now we're gonna now we're gonna start another poll saying, did you just answer that previous poll telling the truth? 
Um, <laughs> um, but uh, all right. So I mean, look. I mean, I, I take obviously everyone honest there. So sixty-five percent said yes, but thirty-five percent of people said they were not happily living in one of their communities today. So if the people that are operating and owning these communities don't feel that way, how is the public supposed to want to go live in one of those communities? Um, so Lori, um, uh, and you know, while we have the poll open, let's just do one more because there could be uh, this could be tied into it, and this is one that Lynn had suggested, and it's. Um, and it's about reopening. What do you believe will be the most important to prospective residents' families, um, you know, reopening? The ability to visit, technology in the room, or transparency around testing of staff and residents? And again, these are very scientific. We're going to be publishing these later. All right, so the results are coming in now. And uh, it's a 50-50 split almost, it seems, between the ability to visit and the transparency around testing of staff and residents. So the ability to visit is important. And if there is you know, future um, pandemics, you know that there's no way to really make that happen without you know, some of the things we're seeing with Thrive doing their glass walls or a sort of lantern has something where they're using, um, you know, gloves that you use for veterinarians to come in and hug your family. It's not necessarily the same thing. Again, I'm not trying to do a negative here, but just looking at that. So, Lori, now let's hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I mean, you, you, that's what I was going to say is when Lynn was talking about residents that don't see themselves um, living in our buildings, to me, the bigger problem is CEOs, executives, people in our industry don't even see themselves living in our buildings and that's a problem like that's a huge problem they don't i've sat in rooms outside of you know the the one you referenced a minute ago i've sat in many other rooms where the question has been asked who here would live in one of your buildings and i'm like one of the only people that raised my hand proudly yeah I, I would love to live in my building now i think they're awesome they're beautiful they're they're current they're you know they're it's a hospitality experience it's a cool place um but sadly, you know, uh, and I know Lynn would say the same thing about her buildings, but sadly, we're a minority. And um, when, when it comes down to the truth, and I think that just, again, demonstrates where the bigger problem is. Lynn? Well, Lori, I would live in my physical spaces, but I'm not sure that the programming that occurs in even some of my communities would resonate with me long term. And it, for me, I want to be in an environment where I can not only engage, but have more say in what's going on. And I think in most of our communities, we've evolved from doing it all for people to letting people talk about what they want in terms of activities and programming and food and and the like. But I don't think we've really enabled people to uh, participate actively in putting together those programs. And I think for me as a boomer, and I realize I'm older than a lot of people on this call, uh, that's really important. I'm used to control, surprise, surprise. I'm used to controlling my environment. <laughs> I'm used to deciding what I want to do, and I'm used to making it happen. And that's going to be important to me, and frankly, I think to most boomers moving forward. Now, why is that important now? Because remember I said I got an 88-year-old mother and a 96-year-old mother-in-law. I'm the decision maker. So I want to go in and say, yeah, this feels good. I see my mother or my mother-in-law here. So, before, uh, Ken, I want to get your, your input here, but I do see that we do have some questions. Uh, Jason, I believe, is in the background, has somebody ready. I also see that my battery, for some reason, is draining really quickly. So, um, Jason, are you coming live in? Uh, you may want to try, type in, or do you have a question you want to bring in from the audience now? I think yeah. we were trying to bring somebody else live to ask a question to you guys. Yeah, um, I can't bring anyone live, but uh, as the beaded uh, Q&A fairy, I, I have some questions queued up that people have been asking. 
Uh, and I'll throw one at you now. It's from, uh, and I'm so sorry for this, I'm going to mispronounce your name, uh, Grace Andrushkiewicz. Apologies, from Rendeva. Uh, and Grace says, as a vendor in this space, we're trying hard to help senior leading clients with their PR efforts, but we're finding that many are hesitant and fearful of the media twisting their stories. Do you guys have any thoughts uh, to help encourage them to consider going on the offense? I, oh, I can hear that. On that. First of all, I mean, where does fear and misinformation come from? You know, from either the, the public or the media, it's lack of familiarity, lack of exposure. I can't talk positively about a place that I haven't been to or heard other people say positive things about. So what it comes to, if, if you want to personalize something and allow somebody to see themselves in an environment, you've got to get them into that environment. So what that means is that you're speaking with you know, the lifestyle people at your local paper or local television outlets and you're actually inviting them in and they're and they're naturally going to be curious why they're being invited so you can say look we want to show you what this is what we do how we do it and how much people appreciate what's happening here because if you understand it and you see us and you talk to us and talk to people here, your perceptions on on who we are what we do and who we do it for are going to change and they're going to change for the better and that makes that person a better reporter uh, a better editor whatever that is is they can't make decisions on things that they haven't seen and experienced themselves so bring them in don't be afraid of them mm -hmm. i'd also i'd also it, with that get too soapboxy media people do not have an agenda they don't wake up in the morning and say hey how can how can i hurt this industry or show them in a negative light i mean they're yet yesterday they're writing about you know the tire center in town and tomorrow they're going to be writing about a furniture store and the week after that they're going to be talking about you know, a local farm somewhere they're just not as well educated on the specifics of industries and businesses as we want to think that they are they're just like you and me bring them in let them see what you're doing let them ask questions let them ask questions of your employees and the people that are working there they're going to leave with a way better picture and that's how they're going to present you mm -hmm. that's fair uh, Jason, Let me ask you about know? ageism here, though. Let's talk a little bit about ageism. We we've, we've got uh, some real sticky ism issues issues that we're dealing with as a nation, mm -hmm. um, and those are important. They need to stand alone. The Black Lives Matter uh, movement is important in and of itself. So I don't. My comments are not to minimize that or undermine it in any way. But I do believe that ageism is a major issue for us, and I think when we try to create, uh, when we bring people in, and they see older adults who need care and assistance, or can't do things on their own, I do think that that creates a, a negative image in people's mind or they they feel it differently than we might want them to look at it and that's part of the issue uh that we as a society have to deal with i don't think there's simple answers for any of that but i do think it's something that plays plays into some of the work we have to do so i, I do see a question here that i think we'll get ken going is that or a comment is that from Teresa jenna this to me is a very, very naive industry when it comes to marketing and carry forward positive messages. People yeah. decide, need to be trained and exposed to the importance of marketing communications. Ken? <laughs> <laughs> it's so it, true. It, was that a how question? Uh, how, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it was just kind of, it was just a comment. It was, it was in, in, in the chat. And, and I mean, absolutely, uh, Michael, not unlike the vast majority of businesses and industries that you work with, every day this it, it, this is not a top of mind topic with most people most businesses have yeah. really kind of defined you know they're, they're social media people they're marketing people maybe some communications people and a lot of times that's one person who just happens to be the boss mm -hmm. it, it is not particularly difficult to reach out to people especially and i, I can't stress this enough anybody that's wronged you if media presented something wrong you pick up the phone and call they're not going to shut you down. <laughs> Invite them to come. They're going to come. Let them see. I mean, that's that's marketing. That's PR. That's community. That's all that stuff rolled into into one. This isn't something that requires sixty second television ads in prime time. Is these 
Think of who the most influential people to your business is or your businesses then invite them in, let them give them a reason to come. And then you can also stretch that umbrella a lot wider. Mm -hmm. Look at who else is influential in your community, women's groups, senior groups, religious groups. Uh, as I think that's a great suggestion. I, I saw, uh, God is my witness, I saw more you know, nursing homes and senior living things as a motorcyclist visiting people on group rides where we would roll up to visit someone that was there and, you know, the people would go nuts. You'd come out, you'd see the you know, 85 year old grandma sitting on the back of a motorcycle and someone would stick a cigarette in her mouth or whatever to, you know, so she could look cool. And it was just a really fun experience for people. But we're in looking around and we're having snacks and having lemonade. And so we're, for some of us, that's the first time we'd ever seen a facility like that. If we've never been there and haven't seen it, man, we can't imagine it. So we tend to think the worst. Yeah. So, Ken. I, uh, preparing for this, I went back and read up on Harley. And, you know, the, the notion, at least as I understood from what I read, is that Harley wanted to equate themselves with a lifestyle that people wanted. Yes. And that feels really right to me in our industry. We, we need to talk about a lifestyle that people want, a lifestyle that gives people the power to live the life they want, the freedom to mm -hmm. enjoy these years and do as much as they can. I, you know, to me, those are really important images. From your perspective, mm -hmm. how can we do that? What are the images? What are the things you think people want to see that would enable us to put forth our lifestyle brand? That's a, a really great. Uh, and well thought question, Lynn, because in our case, the word lifestyle was a, we didn't say let's create a lifestyle. That word, that terminology that's now ingrained in the, the DNA of the business came out of these discussions of, look, people see us for something that's not accurate. And they see right. the people who enjoy this as somehow, you know, low, low class, bad, redneck, criminal, people. Yep. So we need to create an environment and a positioning around this business that allows anyone to see themselves taking part in this. And mm -hmm. I can right. see my neighbors doing this. I can see my right. friends doing it. And the word lifestyle came out of that. So that, that was largely what we did to uh, empower our, our, our and encourage our dealers around the country to begin having events on their physical property to in, invite people in to open their doors and allow uh, the Elks Club or the League of Women Voters, people who ordinarily have never been in our environment, to come in and hold their meet their monthly meeting there, feed them, entertain them, you make sure they have a nice time, big punch bowl, whatever that is. And as they're in that environment, all those shields come down. Hey, these are just regular people. This is pretty cool. I could see myself doing this, or I see somebody in here that I actually recognize. Pow. And that's what they tell other people about when they leave. I mean, lifestyle is a word that every human being defines differently. Because when you say lifestyle to someone, they immediately engage their brain and start picturing themselves having that life, whatever that life is. So the more they get to see positive imagery of what you do and how you do it, the more, God forbid, you get people in to actually see what you're doing and they tell others, the more positive it's going to be for you in the long run. Yeah, no, that, that, that's some great feedback there. And thank you. You know, just paying attention to the clock here. I mean, I guess if you guys are cool, we can go over a couple of minutes. But I know a lot of people they're tuning in probably have something else popping up in the calendar in a few minutes. So it looks like we lost Lori. Um, Lori, if you're, you can hear us or see us, uh, you know, thanks for I joining. I can hear you. <laughs> I just don't um, know why you can't see me. <laughs> all right, well, we can. All right, we can hear you. That's fine. So I guess to wrap things up, um, real quick, um, you know, Lynn. And Lori, um, what do you think, you know, kind of would you say to your peers in the industry right now that, you know, feel that they've got a lot to kind of overcome, you know, as we come out of this pandemic with the messaging and the perception of senior housing? Go ahead, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Sorry. Um, keepers, that's, a, that's okay. That's a big question. Um, you know, I would probably say as just 
due to time. My advice would be, you know, our, our industry and everyone on this call and everybody else that's not on this call, we need to be real with ourselves because, you know, what you're talking about, Ken, and, and Len, you alluded to it too, is that, you know, everyone wants this lifestyle and experience, but at the end of the day, does our industry truly produce that? And sadly, my answer would be no. Um, we're still doing the same thing that we've been doing um, back in the 1990s. I mean, I've been in the industry 21 years and I really haven't seen the needle move a lot. Some of it's regulatory related and we have, you know, probably need to start adapting that. But, you know, for the most part, when it's coming to, you know, how how do we create a place that people want to come? How do we create a a kind of a sexy senior living industry and something that, um, you know, reporters want are proud to report on or congressmen and senators are proud to vote and, and be advocates for us is, you know, we have to be open to change and truly looking, looking at ourselves and what we're doing and do some soul searching and then allow ourselves to say, we are not doing that well and we need to shift and to shift. It's not move the needle a little bit. It's do a 180 pivot and about faith and march a different direction to produce a different outcome because what we're currently doing isn't working and we need to be sexy again we need to be where people want to come to live with us we have a great product we have a great industry we just as an industry really need to start adapting to what the consumer wants and what the times are allowing and deliver that and i think if we can if every operator can commit to that and deliver that we'll have a we'll have a great you know we'll really start to get a lot more momentum we've got to get out of the box let's do some soul searching and change and and really um pivot so we well, again we've got about a minute left here so just to follow up if we just keep the the answers a little bit briefer thanks laura that's great and again i saw ken's do i kind get of, to answer michael i'm sorry i get to answer <laughs> No, you get the answer, of course. But I okay. want to hear your thoughts too now on, you know, can you really make senior living sexy? And Lori we can't see. Can. We can't see Lori can. I, 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 I may be beyond the, that part, but um, no. Listen, I think one of the things we've learned from COVID is that we can change. We've had to change. Mm -hmm. We've had to do things very differently. We've the regulators have demanded it. The consumers have demanded it, and. What have we learned from this? We can, we can change. Change is possible. We can have impact. We can create a better situation for the people we serve. I think Lori's spot on and consumer, you know, the person-centered movement, the uh, pioneer movement, all of that, the greenhouses, it was all mm -hmm. about listening to your consumer. Yeah. So whether you call it person-centered or consumer-centered, that's what we've got to do. We've often been staff, uh, regulatory-driven or even staff-driven. And I think Lori's message is really clear. We've got to be consumer-driven. We have the ability to change. And we need to listen to what our consumer wants and deliver on it. Of course. Yeah. And that's in every industry, especially right now. That's true. That's true, but we haven't done that. We're realizing that, right? I mean, for our business has been kind of disrupted a little bit with not being able to organize events. So it's it's been, I guess, a great opportunity for us to better understand who we are and why we, you know, why we exist. Ken, um, yeah, any closing remarks? Yeah, I would just say to, to both, uh, Len and Lori both brought up excellent points. I said, what, what are the things that tends to scare a lot of people is they, in businesses that are looking to reposition or to improve their narrative is the belief that the, the problem isn't surmountable and that, you know, because it's a nationwide problem, the point that there has to be a nationwide solution. There doesn't have to be a nationwide solution. Look at your own business. You don't need to be the best senior living facility with the best narrative, the most talked about in the country. You need to be the most talked about respected one in the town that you live in. Keep it local. Mm -hmm. that, that, Ripples will, will will emanate outward, but just keep it local, keep it small, keep it personal. Yeah, good point. Uh, yeah. For you. Well, we're, I guess we're, we're closing up now. I know there's a lot of questions, even the one that uh, Benjamin's asking right now is a lot of the advice is not really relevant because you can't bring guests into senior housing because, you know, because obviously the reasons we know why. Um, okay. 
virtual. I know that's the one thing, but I mean, that's like us right now, bringing everyone together. We will write a summary of this and we will actually go through some of these questions. If there's some, I know we, we said we were gonna try to get some more. We will try to see if we can get some answered. So if there's some good ones, Lynn, Ken, uh, Lori, I may share those with you and we can maybe do a little summary and push out. Um, but before we sign off, Ken, thank you for your time. If everybody is not, uh, if you're not familiar with Ken, which I'm guessing a lot of people tuning in that didn't attend Sliff, um, has an excellent book called Make Some Noise. It tells a story, it's from Harley. Um, Ken is one of the best speakers out there, but you know, like a lot of speakers right now, is not on stage, uh, can't be on stages yet. Um, but I'm gonna put up on the screen right now, you can, um, it's, he does leadership training and consulting on, on these uh, obviously important topic. And uh, it should be popping up any second. And uh, there he is. Oh, yeah. Well done. Are you ready to make some noise? Uh, if you are, click the hell yeah button, and that will take you to kenspeaks.com, which is Ken's site. It's directly taking you to the consulting page, where from there you can learn more about Ken, um, see some samples of his talks, uh, a lot of great stuff in there. And uh, again, thank you, Ken, for joining us today. And um, of course, I have to plug Sliff. It's in the chat. It's pinned right to the top there. Um, we are, as of right now, we're, we're, we're full speed ahead for planning our event November 15th to the 17th, which actually was supposed to be this week. Today was supposed to be the day we're over, overcoming our hangover from being in New Mexico. Um, but we're going to Palm Springs. And, um, you know, we are, of course, um, paying attention to everything out there. I know a lot of the fall events have already been announced. That they're going virtual. We're pretty confident at this stage that by November 15th, the fact that we're in Palm Springs, our event is intimate, always a couple hundred people in a facility with no elevators spread out. We hope to, that we're gonna be welcoming a lot of you um, to probably one of the only events that you go to this year. So um, you can learn about that by clicking the, uh, I guess what was supposed to be the clicky message or taking a look at this other image that I'm going to uh, put up on the screen. So uh, thank you guys again for joining today. You will also get um, a recording of this so you can share it with your family and sit around on the weekend and watch it instead of watching things like Tiger King. So uh, thank you guys very much for joining and uh, have a great day. Stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Ciao. How do we turn this thing off? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>